I just want to thank the organizers of this workshop. It's been a really fun way to wake up on a Friday morning for me and listen to all these exciting talks. So I'm very happy to be here um, and talk a little bit about um, magnetic synapses and neurons that we can design depending on the application. And this ties in very nicely to a couple of the earlier talks. So I appreciate the introduction already to things like neural networks, backpropagation, and artificial neurons and synapses and, and spintronic versions of them. So I will start out uh, motiv motivating uh, why we're interested in magnetism in particular for neuromorphic computing. I will then introduce the type of device that we've been focused on, which is called a Duane Wall Magnetic Tunnel Junction or Duane Wall MTJ. And uh, I'll show you how it can act as both a synapse and a neuron. Uh, then I will focus in particular on some recent work we have on designing these Duane Wall MTJs as synapses um, particularly for on-chip learning using backpropagation. And uh, I, I gave a talk to the Pettispin community a couple months ago. Um, stay tuned because this will be a new paper, not what I talked on a couple months ago. Okay, so at the beginning, I just want to start off acknowledging everyone um, who was involved in this work. Um, the main work I presented was led by, or uh, was, was done by my student, Sam Liu, uh, and then some other of my students in my group, and our um, close collaborators were Dr. Chris Bennett at Sandia, Dr. Patrick Shaw at Pandia, at Sandia, Dr. Matt Marinella, and Joe Friedman as well. So uh, I don't need to dwell too long on the problems with traditional computing when performing data intensive tasks. Uh, we're well aware, I think, in this community that there is a memory wall between compute and memory access. There is a lot of energy loss while idle. And there is also a large wall between analog and digital conversion. And these are one way to motivate why we're very interested in new computing paradigms such as neuromorphic, quantum computing, and unconventional computing. So uh, we take inspiration from the brain, which is very efficient at certain data intensive tasks. There are certain things it's not very good at. We know that we're not gonna win out against a supercomputer on um, summing large numbers, but when we do things like face recognition, we, our, our brains are still a lot better. Um, they can consume about a million times less power than a modern supercomputer for face recognition. And so why is this? There's still a lot to be understood about why this is, but some things we know is that memory and the processing is very interconnected and distributed, um, densely connected together, and there's a lot of parallel processing. And these are inspirations for neural networks with new hardware. Uh, so as introduced in some of the earlier talks, the main building blocks for neuromorphic computing are the neuron and the synapse. So here is the cartoon picture of what's going on, where you're going to have a presynaptic neuron that will receive an input signal. It'll integrate, it'll fire, and that will then um, activate a postsynaptic neuron. These neurons are connected by synapses, which will control the weight of connectivity between them. So, it's, so in the artificial world, we think of it as a resistive weight that can be tuned. OK, so there's a large um, plethora of people working on this problem. And why, in particular, magnetic materials? Um, first of all, they have fairly low right energy and right time compared to other emerging resistive memory elements. They're non-volatile, which provide reduces leakage and makes them compatible with in-memory computing. Um, they're back in the line compatible. They have radiation hardness, and we've done some work in this area. You can see this recent paper. And this is exciting for, for new directions for computing, such as space. And in particular, they have complex features that can be mapped onto new systems. And so I think this is what is very exciting about magnetic materials, as you've seen in some of the earlier talks, things like domain wall dynamics, oscillatory behavior and magnetic, magnetic strafe field interaction are all existing there at the device level that we can make use of for these new computing paradigms. So this is a large field and there's been a lot of work on racetrack type computing, uh, stochastic tunnel junctions, sprint torque oscillators, skirmions and others. So this is just um, uh, touching on the different, different directions. So in particular here, um, I will discuss the Duane Wall MTJ. So here's what it looks like. We have a um, ferromagnetic track here comprised of a heavy metal, tantalum, cobalt boron MGO in this case. And um, here we have a tunnel junction in the center. 
and then it's patterned into a three terminal structure. And the main difference between this and a standard SDT MRAM is that with this three terminal structure, uh, we pattern this Kofi B layer to be a wire and it can host a domain wall, which is this white strip here, the transition region between two different magnetic domains. And this domain wall can be pushed back and forth with current. So we can apply a current from this in terminal to this clock terminal, and then drive this domain wall to different positions. And depending on its position, we can then read out the resistance state of the device through this tunnel junction here. And the domain wall can propagate using either a spin transfer torque, that's when the current comes in and interacts directly with the magnetization of this domain wall, or spin orbit torque, that's when the current goes into this heavy metal and that produces a spin current that can also move the domain wall. And we will explore both of these options. So um, these Dwayne Wall MTJs have a lot of promise for both in-memory and neuromorphic circuits. And um, we've done some work on showing, for example, small circuits that can have concatenation and fan out. Um, there's been work on magnetic synapses and then creating all spin neural networks by ourselves and other groups. Um, so we've been working on building these prototypes. Here is a prototype where it's acting like a logic function. Um, so this is again the domain wall track and the tunnel junction in the center here and we've been able to show things like very um very improved cycle to cycle variability here is the switching of the device over 10 different cycles and we get around 10 percent cycling variability we also are achieving a very good on off ratio of around um, 200 percent and so more information about the um the prototype results please see this recent paper and apply physics letters because the rest of this talk is going to be in simulation world so um, in addition to acting like, like an in-memory computing element, these domain wall MTJs can act as a leaky integrate and fire neuron. Um, we do this simply by offsetting this tunnel junction to one side. So now when we pass this current between the in and the clock, as the domain wall moves, this is this integration has this time element to it. Until it reaches this tunnel junction, it'll change its resistance state. And that can lead to, for example, the gate of a transistor and cre create a spike, or there's other ways to make that create a spiking output. And then we can achieve leaking through many different methods. We can uh, have an ex uh, external field, for example, through an additional magnetic layer that will, when the current is not on, drive the dream wall back this way. Or we could also um, introduce things like shape anisotropy or, um, or crystal anisotropy gradients that will want the dream wall to sit over here. So when we take away our impulse, it'll relax back. And so you can see this in simulation. Um, this is the minimal position versus time, integrating and then leaking back. This is with um, a field leak at zero Kelvin in the simulation. And here is with a shape and a soft be leak at room temperature in the simulation. So going up and back. So um, you can see we've, we've done a number of work on the neuron-like implementation of the Rainwall MTJs. And so you can look at these papers here. Um, for this talk, I want to focus on the synapse-like um, implementation. So to make this device act like a synapse, what we do is extend the length of this top tunnel junction such that when the domain wall is settling at different positions along this domain wall track, we can get uh, uh, different weights, different resistance states as the when we read out through this tunnel junction. And um, so we've shown, for example, that this can act as a um, perform spike time independent plasticity and be useful as a synapse. And we can then put these together and we can have our magnetic neurons and our magnetic synapses. I have the input layer and the output layer can be more magnetic neurons and we can build up more neural network layers. And so uh, we can't imagine this could lead to a, a fully spintronic um, monolithic platform using magnetic materials. Okay, so focusing in on the synapses, um, here's a standard setup for mat matrix vector multiplication and back backpropagation weight updates. And you heard a little about this in an earlier talk. So um, here is what the circuit looks like, where we have our synapses that are acting as our weights that are gonna control how much these input voltages are connected to the outputs here. And uh, we, we're going to get these currents that flow through the tunnel junctions. Each one will have its own resistance value dependent on the dream wall position. And then they can be summed, um, integrated on a capacitor, and digitized by an ADC. OK, so then for um, backpropagation and weight updates, 
we can then pass the current through these two terminals and then adjust the this domain wall position and therefore adjust the weights. So for backpropagation onto blurning, there are three essential things we need for these synapses to behave like. First of all, we need linear weight updates. We need very minimal state dependence on exactly where this domain wall is or what resistance state the device is at when we change its weight. Two, we need controllable weights. We want for a given input, know what resistance state it's going to go to. And three, we want symmetry. We want the same response of the synapse for a positive and neg negative directions of the inputs. So here we set out um, using a physics rich model to understand how we can control the linearity, controllability, and symmetry of the Duane Wall TJ synapse. So this was simulated in the MUMAX 3 simulator. And what we did was we, um, here's our um, magnetic wire and it's 50 nanometers wide. It's around 1.5 nanometers thick. And we have our dream wall here. And here we introduced a series of notches. Here's 32 notches along the edge of the device, which we found is greatly useful for improving the linearity, which is, as you'll see later, is very important for backpropagation training. Um, here, these notches are, we space them 30 to 50 nanometers apart, depending on whether we use spin orbital torque or spin transfer torque. And you can see this here, the dream wall position versus time as it moves across this track. Um, this, is this, this is the simulation at 300K. This is for the uh, notched. We get this very linear behavior compared to if we have a smooth wire with no notches. And so here we can see that we also have high symmetry. Um, this is the dream wall position over time, um, just pushing it back and forth across this notch synapse. And you can see as you zoom in all the different levels that the dream wall is sampling as it moves across. And uh, plotting this as the average change in the position, um, comparing to the pulse polarity in both directions, we see we have good symmetry in both directions and a highly linear um, average change. So a further, uh, another way we can uh, look at this linearity is what's called a conductance heat map shown here. So um, what we're introducing here is a two resistor representation of the tunnel junction. So we have this dream wall at a certain position. There's some portion of this tunnel junction is in a parallel resistance state and the other one is in an anti-parallel resistance state. And um, so we can look at this here and we repeat the simulation over 30 different ramps up and down. And so um, for these heat maps, what we want to see is for linearity, we want to see that the change in the conductance, this delta G, is independent of what conductance we're at. That's when we, we won't have any state dependence to our change in conductance. And that's what we clearly see here, for, the, here, for example, for the spin transfer torque um, type switching at zero Kelvin. And we see very little dependence on the conductance that it's at. And this is the CDF is the cumulative distribution function on the probability of the conductance change being less than or equal to its value. Um, so this is for a positive update and this is for a negative update going the other direction. So when we go, when we introduce temperature into the model, we um, do see some stochasticity introduced with spin transfer torque method for switching the domain wall, but it's still fairly linear and fairly low stochasticity. If we introduce um, instead, use at room temperature when we use spin orbit torque switching of the swing wall, then we get a lot more stochasticity. Um, this is because with spin orbit torque switching, we have what's called this Jaslonsky Mori interaction, and um, that wants to promote a certain chirality to our domain wall. It wants to be in an EL configuration, it's called. And um, the domain wall will then um, more, be more likely to not settle exactly where it was supposed to in order to maintain its chirality. So we introduce this. Um, stochastic behavior using spin orbit torque. Okay, so here, um, given this non this linearity and the symmetry, we wanted to compare how this dream wall MTJ is behaving as a synapse compared to other leading synaptic devices. And so here is the picture of what's going with with our device. So this is as it ramps up and down for spin transfer torque and for spin orbit torque. And this was over averaged over 30 ramps. And so this, um, this colored shaded area is the standard deviation over 30 ramps. Um, so we compared this to two different other leading synapse types. And this is data taken from um, the groups at Sandia. So they had this data. Um, so we can compare it to electrochemical random access memory here and also to uh, a tenom oxide um, re-ram type device. And so, we see that the Dwayne Wall MTJ um, 
had slightly greater stochasticity, greater um, noise than the EC RAM, um, but with improved linearity, especially for the STT case. And then compared to the tenom oxide VRAM, we can um, see a lot of benefits over the improved linearity. Okay, so we can do some further comparisons to um, these different types of um, devices. So the nonlinearity in the updates. So for ideally symmetric response, we want both the sign and the magnitude of the nonlinearity to be equal. So we can see that we get a pretty good case for the Dreamwell um, devices. And we can also look at the cycle to cycle variation that we're getting in the simulation based on temperature and um, tunnel junction parameters. Okay, so um, going further to wanting to then put this into doing a task, um, we wanted to make sure to include variation as much as possible. So we um, used the magnitudes and distributions from applied materials experimental data of many tunnel junctions. Um, so this is from this paper from them. Um, so from that, we introduced a random variations in the MTJ parallel resistance around 12%, which is what they saw in their experiments and random variations in the tunnel magneto resistance around 7%. And this is at the same feature node as what we simulated. Um, using that, we then generated 20 perturbed lookup tables um, for both STT and SOT and um, assigned them randomly to the devices. And we also, as I said, included the room temperature model. Okay, so started out with the MNIST, um, the handwritten um, digit recognition task. So here's the MNIST accuracy versus EPOC as we train our um, neural network using these ram MTJ synapses. So a few things to notice here. Uh, firstly, the, in black here is the numerical solution. So that's kind of what we're trying to compare against. And so first of all, um, in this blue curve here is where we did not have any notches in our drain wall um, synapse. And we idealized it to just continuous weight levels with no dream wall drift. So this is like the idealized case if we were able to get rid of the notches and have no drift, but we still included the temperature effects and the device variations. And so what this shows us is that um, as expected for this type of uh, operation, there's very high re resilience resiliency to process variations. And um, that's, that's really due to this high linearity. We don't have a lot of dependence on exactly what particular state the device is at. Okay, so if we instead have the 32 notches in our device, like I showed in the picture, um, we do see a reduction in the MNIST uh, classification accuracy. So um, the, this is because um, our update conductance will get rounded, you can say, to the nearest discrete possible position of the stream wall that lowers the accuracy. One thing to note is the alpha here is just the um, learning rate, the size of the step for each update. Okay, so then we wanted to also look at this more um, challenging fashion MNIST task where we are recognizing different articles of clothing. Uh, so um, here again, for the um, purely continuous, no notches type um, Dream Wall MTJ, we see very high accuracy. Um, if we go to 32 notches, we see this reduction. Uh, this, is, this is this shaded regions because we put in um, multiple uh, random inputs and then try to see how it how it um, trained with random inputs. So we can um, we can use some known tools to improve this accuracy. So the first one we can try is called periodic carry. And this is shown in, in um, orange here. So here we can increase the weight resolution essentially by splitting the high and low resistance significant bits into two devices. So essentially we're doubling the number of, of effective weight levels or notches that we can have. And then we can see the boost here. OK, so here's where things start to get, I think, a little more interesting. Um, so what we find here is that when you look back at spin transfer torque versus spin orbit torque, you might assume that spin transfer torque would be better. But actually, I mean, for people who are in this field, it's maybe obvious. Um, spin orbit torque with the high stochasticity actually um, makes it really helps improve the accuracy. So you shown this here, here's the fashion MNIST accuracy, and we simulated it for spin transfer torque. These are the ones in circles here versus spin orbit torque at two different temperatures. And here we can see for spin transfer torque with continuous level, so no notches, um, the spin transfer torque is always winning out and having the best accuracy. If we 
look at the notched example with the 32 notches, um, here spin, spin orbit torque is in with the triangles, we can see that actually the spin orbit torque is what is um, outperforming the spin transfer torque. And so this stochasticity, it actually helps aid us in uh, our training. So um, a question we can ask ourselves is how long of a wire or how many notches do we need to get high accuracy? Uh, and so um, what we see is that the higher stochasticity of the spin orbitoric greatly reduces the number of notches we need. So here is the accuracy and here is for spin transfer torque at a certain learning rate. We need, we, we show here that, okay, well, we would need up to like 256 notches to really get high accuracy. Uh, we could, for example, um, change the learning rate. So um, increase the step size of how much um, we're going to change at each iteration. And then we can boost up our accuracy that way. Um, but with the spin orbit torque, we actually find that we don't need to do that. We can, even with our low number of notches, we can still maintain um, pretty high accuracy. So what's going on here is that the small updates that would normally uh, fail to move a domain wall uh, can do so because of the stochasticity. And um, so you can think of that as an effective higher resolution than the number of notches that are present. So we have material parameters we can be, that can be tuned to further increase this accuracy. For example, the domain wall length itself. Um, this can be affected by thing, materials parameters such as the, um, the anisotropy um, and the stiffness of the magnetic material. And if we, if we increase the size of our domain wall, it actually could help increase the stochasticity of the weight update. Um, also, there's other materials parameters we can use. For example, the heavy metal spin hall angle. Here we just assumed a very modest spin hall angle for tantalum, because that's what we're using in our, our devices. Um, and the DMI factor will affect the velocity of the domain wall and also its angle. And so there, there are a lot of materials parameters we can uh, work with here to further tune these magnetic devices depending on their application. Um, I actually just threw in this slide last minute because of an earlier question about the projected energy consumption. So my colleague Chris Bennett at Sandia did spend some time trying to calculate the total energy cost that we expect for these type of domain wall TJs. In this simulation, he um, had a full network where it was the synapses and the neurons were all made out of domain wall MTJs. And he assumed middle of the road parameters of domain wall velocity 100 meters per second, switching current density around one times 10 to 7 amps per centimeter squared, which is um, similar to what was talked about earlier in our workshop, um, 30 nanometer wide devices. And here he included the analog to digital converters, the comparators, and subspecial circuit that all are needed at the output layer. And actually, what we found is that those um, output circuits dominate the total energy cost, not the domain wall MTJ circuit. And so, but you can look at here to get some numbers to start getting some ballparks for how the, the energy consumption would compare to um, other technologies. Okay, so here I want to conclude by emphasizing that magnetic devices could address current bottlenecks in computing, and the domain wall MTJ can perform synapse and neuron functions for um, device and also can have device inherent bio inspired behaviors that we can make use of. Um, it can be designed to solve major challenges for on-chip propagation, back propagation. It provides linearity, controllability, and symmetry um, that can be tuned by materials properties. And um, the stochasticity can really be a big benefit here. And I think that this is a really exciting result because a lot of times when I talk to people about working on, the, on Dwayne Walls for synapses, they're like, well, you're not going to have an, enough number of weights. And so I hope this shows that maybe we do have enough weights for what you want to accomplish. Okay. Thank you.